introduce myself and we get going, um, I would love for people, um, we've already had a couple people in the chat here, but go ahead and post um, where you are. And if you are involved with a, a league, um, which league you are involved with. Um, we'd love to see where everybody is. Um, so while that happens, um, I will start introducing myself. Um, like I said, I'm Booty Quake. Um, I'm the co-creator of Short Track Roller Derby and one of the two co-founders of Roller Skate Club, which is our uh, local recreational roller, derby, roller skating club here in Vancouver, BC. And uh, I'm gonna talk us through kind of where we started and kind of how we started um, uh, coming up with the concept of short track roller derby and then where we've gotten to. Um, so in 2017, so my uh, fellow co-founder is Lulu Demon and um, people might know Lulu from Pivot Star, which she created um, starting back in around 2008, I think. Um, so quite, uh, she ran that company for a long time. I started with roller derby athletics, which people might know me from. Um, and we both sold those businesses to other roller derby entrepreneurs. Um, in 2019, so we could go all in on our brick and mortar roller skating club right in time for the pandemic to hit. So that was fun. Uh, so in 2017, we kind of really started Roller Skate Club up in 2018. Um, but in 2017, we were in the idea space and we were trying to do two things. Thing one, we were trying to save roller derby from itself. And we'll talk more about what that means, but we, we were trying to figure out ways that it could be easier to make roller derby happen, essentially, okay? And the second thing we were trying to do is we were trying to create something even bigger that could take all of the awesome special sauce that we experienced and we saw other women particularly experience and non-binary people in roller derby and figure out how to make that accessible to a wider audience. So the concept being that, uh, you know, all this empowerment, all this community, all this confidence building, all that stuff, um, we love that. And we just have seen how powerful that can be. And we really, wanted to figure out how we could bring that to more people, maybe people who didn't necessarily ever expect to see themselves smashing into other people in front of an audience of cheering fans, right? So we were like, there's got to be a middle ground here for all those people to be able to experience all that, all that awesomeness, okay, all that great roller derby special sauce. So that was kind of our two kind of co-missions at the time, and we were kind of trying to work things out and figure out what are we doing. So starting with roller derby, um, what I said was like saving roller derby from itself. So we saw that roller derby was full of kind of its own trappings that it had built into itself, into its constructs and how we run our leagues and how we run our games and everything else that make it really, really hard to pull off. So just logistically super, super challenging. So that is what led us to create short track roller derby. So I'm going to focus on short track roller derby. And um, if anyone wants to talk more about roller skate club, about how a year ago today, we had about 300 members coming to roller skate club to do all kinds of different roller skating things, including roller derby. And as of, you know, um, one year and one week ago, we were closed. And then now we're back up to about 150 members. Um, we have coach training programs and we have um, ways that people can become part of their own roller derby, um, roller skate club in their own city, own, own town. Um, I'm happy to stick around on the um, call after the end of our kind of hour here together and um, talk more about that, but we're going to focus on the short track roller derby stuff today. Um, and I do want to keep it kind of high level. So I'm going to try not to get into the weeds on specific rules, but just kind of broad strokes and how we think roller derby is the answer to post pandemic. Let me start over. How we think short track roller derby is the answer to post pandemic roller derby to making it happen for all of our leagues that are in some pretty dire straits right now. So I'm going to pause and I'm going to just check in on some of the 
places that people are coming from, we've got Greater Vancouver Roller Derby and I've seen Terminal City Roller Derby, both from Vancouver area here, awesome. Redneck Betty's Ra Ra Right, Swift Current, Saskatchewan, hello, shell on earth. We've got St. John, New Brunswick, Saigon, Vietnam, founded the team back in September and just had their first short track game two weeks ago, amazing. That is so awesome. Ontario Roller Derby, North Bay, Ontario, Kelowna, Colorado 10th Mountain Roller Dolls. There's so many people here from all over the place. More Nova Scotia, uh, Rockford, Illinois, Purple Haze from Orkney Islands, exotic, thank you. Amazing, Sweden, more Sweden, oh, so good. Joe means Joe from Red Deer, hi Joe, nice to see you again. Tennessee, Halmstad Roller Derby in uh, Sandra and Sparks from Sweden, amazing. Central New York, Mission BC, holy moly, Texas, Lethbridge, Alberta, it goes on. Okay, so what a great group. Calgary um, Junior Roller Derby, amazing. Hi, Ingrid, nice to see you. Vienna Roller Derby, oh my gosh, did you bring the, 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 the cheerleaders? I just love those guys, they're amazing. And Hell's Bells, Helena, Montana, amazing. Okay, so we have people from all over the world, which is fucking rad, and um, I'm so excited to um, talk with you all more. All right, so here's what we saw as the big barriers to roller derby that we tried to solve with the game of short track roller derby. Okay, so mainly it has to do with resources. Number one is space, right? Venues is always the biggest challenge for roller derby leagues, right? I can see heads like nodding. Um, the, and, and, and I wanna also be super clear here with this whole session that we're on here that I am not here to shit on flat track roller derby or bank track roller derby in any way. I really see short track roller derby as being very complementary to either of those rule sets. And so I'm not here to poop on any of that. But those wonderful, incredible fairy godmothers of roller derby that split off from the original bank track team in Texas and created the first flat track roller derby league did not stop to think about the rest of us and how we were going to fit that enormous floor into our venues around the world. They're like, well, we have this huge warehouse. It's Texas, land is cheap. We're gonna make this massive 8,000 square foot track. And the rest of you can figure out how to make that work. So it was a great idea and we've all just done it all this time, but boy, wouldn't it have been great if they had figured out a way to make it fit into a regulation sporting facility size that was smaller than a hockey rink, right? Ah, oh, so we said, that's the first thing. So we said, can we make a game that you can fit on a tennis court or a basketball court, suddenly opening up a zillion more cheaper venues for roller derby to be practiced and played in. So that was number one. So the track design for short track, and I'll show you a couple of pictures in a moment. So you're not just looking at my face this whole time. Um, but the, the flat, the short track design fits in a, um, it's shorter than a, a regulation basketball court. So it fits in the width, um, you know, not even including like the, um, you know, a basketball court has sideline area. So within the inbounds area of a basketball court. Um, so it'll fit in a tennis court as well. Number two is the human resources to play roller derby. So we'll talk about the skaters. Okay. So if you're gonna play in a game, you need 11 skaters aside minimum. Most of the time, ideally we've got 15, right? Or 14, what have you. So that's 22 people right there. And if you're looking at your practices and you're trying to, maybe not every practice is a full scrimmage with a full side, but you kind of need like 11 people on a team at a scrimmage to be able to roll through jams on time and have you know two blockers um uh, packs of four and then a three jammer rotation like that's what we're talking about right so you need 22 people out of practice to be able to do a scrimmage so if your league is 25 people and you're expecting 75 percent attendance at practices then you're never going to have 22 people at practice and if you do have 22 people at practice three of them are going to be injured or by halfway through the scrimmage they're going to be sitting out, oh, I'm nursing this thing, or I'm not in shape, so I'm making an excuse to tie my shoes, or whatever, 
right? Or no one's going to jam or whatever the deal is. So you're struggling all the time with, um, with getting enough people, enough, like a nexus of people to do the thing that you want to do. Um, if you then talk about the second part of human resources, which is our officials, um, and maybe wave or post in the, in the chat if you are an official, because um, we love our officials. Um, I'm gonna get the numbers wrong here, but on a, in, a, in a sanctioned bout, a full-on bout, you're gonna have six or seven on-skate officials. And then I think the number is like 112 off-skate officials. I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong, right? It's like 14 or 17, seven, Claire says seven, but that's the on-skates, right, Claire? Um, there's so many like people taking stats and doing all this stuff. So, I mean, if I've been to small town roller derby bouts, where um, there were five people in the stands and uh, 38 people on the track and being officials and there's kind of no one left in town to come to the game. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's kind of crazy. So, um, <clears throat> so officials, big uh, challenge for leagues to recruit and train and uh, motivate and reward officials. Um, and we, there's just, there's just a, that's a whole thing. It's a whole other team, right? So what did we set up to do? We fit the track into a basketball court size. A smaller track means fewer bodies on the track. Otherwise it's just a crowd, right? So the game is played three on three, it's two blockers and one jammer from each team. Uh, so the team, uh, the bench is seven. So you, you, you dress seven skaters for a game. Um, and we'll talk more about how that all works. Um, and then the third thing is that the rules and the scoring we designed very specifically to be not only fun and competitive, obviously, but also to be very easy to score so that we can play the game with two on-skate officials, a timer, and a scorekeeper. So four officials gets the job done, okay? If you are, um, you know, a sponsored team and you're competing at a high level and you're, you know, um, I don't know, Rydell's in there throwing money at you and it's for rankings and for money and dollars and you want to get more people in there tracking the stats and the lineups and who jammed when and who scored the points. I mean, that's wonderful, but I just don't think that's really necessary when we're talking about kind of recreational um, and competitive roller derby, but kind of not at the high level we're not talking about the the two percent of roller derby that plays in wftda sanctioned bouts ever okay we're talking about fun accessible competitive challenging roller derby that you can pull off and pull off a public bout you can sell some tickets the fans have something fun to see your teammates have something fun to do and you all go home at the end of the day and you drink some beers right Right. Okay. So that's the idea. So checking my notes here. Has anyone who's on the call and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to. Has anyone on the call um, uh, been played roller derby? Who has played roller derby? Anyone? Well, we know that our friends from Vietnam here have, oh, there's lots of people. All right. Amazing. 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 So um what the feedback i get from people who have played flat track roller derby and then they come and they play short track the feedback that i hear from people is oh it feels like playing roller derby right like with those would you agree i'm seeing some nodding heads yeah those of you that have done it you're like yeah it feels a lot like roller derby we've played two on one drills in roller derby. We've played all different combinations of blockers and offense and jammers in scrimmage based drills for, for um, you know, five on five roller derby, right? And so going to two blockers on two blockers with two jammers uh, and the dimensions of the track and everything else, it just actually kind of feels like roller derby, which is great. Um, and it, it's so great to hear that there's lots of people who have been, who have been playing, that's so awesome switching from WFTDA ranked games to short track. It was the same for Claire and Easy Break Oven over in Vietnam. It felt like 
it felt like roller derby. So that's super good to hear. Um, okay, I'm gonna spotlight myself again. I was just switching over to gallery view. So if anyone, I don't know, when I spotlight, I'm doing this for the recording. So sometimes it changes your view and sometimes it doesn't, I don't know. Um, so we've got people here who have played, we've got people here who are nodding their heads in agreement about some of the, um, the concepts. I'm going to um, show you a couple of images now, um, just so you can get um, a lay of the land on the track because that's, um, oops, I did not uh, get the right thing. There we go. Okay, so this is not my best graphic design work, my friends, but can everyone see my screen with the kind of weird overlays of ovals on it right now? Give me a yep. thumbs up or a nod if I, you can see it, okay. Um, so the pink, the, the sort of dark pink here, outer line is the outer track boundary of the WFTDA flat track. Okay, and where my mouse is here, this inner line within the yellow here, that is the inside line of the WFTDA track. And then the outside uh, light pink shaded area here is the, um, the safety lane around the outside of the WFTDA track. Um, so the overall, if we drew a box around all of this, it would be 108 feet by 75 feet, 8,100 square feet and about 8,800 square meters for my, did I get that right? Or is it 80 square meters? It's 800 square meters for my um, metric folk. So the short track is the yellow shaded area here. And then the gray is the short track kind of safety lane around the outside. Um, and we can talk about safety and we could do this sort of assumes space or a wall on the outside of this, but not, you know, columns and stuff. We can talk about how to make this kind of work with the WFTDA's safety guidelines so that everyone's insurance is um, very happy and we're being very safe. Um, but it's 3,500 square feet. So it's about a third um, not a third, it's a little more than a third, um, a little less than half of the area. Um, and it's 73 feet to the, the outside of the gray um, by 48 feet. So a, a basketball court is like 50 feet by 94 feet. So we're kind of in a shorty basketball feet, basketball court. There you go. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks, Sugar. Okay. So this is our skate church when we are in party mode and you can see the inside track boundary right there. And you can see the outside track boundary right there. And you can see the uh, you know elementary school gym uh, basketball hoop there for reference as well. And then I'll show you what it looks like in um, derby mode when we're playing roller derby. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, playing roller derby three on three with our uh, skaters in the middle and our two officials on skates. And we have a timer back here in the background and we have our scorekeeper um, sitting back here at the stage, I believe, um, keeping score on a, like a volleyball scorecard where we um, tip the numbers over. Um, so we don't have like, we, we could do a bunch of paper and pen, you know, tracking of the score, but we just kind of flip the numbers over as the scores go up, um, kind of just using the scoreboard as the score sheet. Um, so yeah, it's pretty fun. I, I'm gonna, talk about um, you know kind of the structure of the game and so forth and how we make it work with three on three. Um, one of the most exciting things about the game is that we um, we start the game the first half we play turning right um, so the opposite of the derby direction that you are used to and then the second half we go turning left so we call it direction one and direction two and sometimes we remind people what that is by saying turning right and turning left um uh but that's pretty fun so and we chose that for a couple of reasons one because we're old and sore and um our bodies don't work very well but two and we're from turning left for 13 years uh but two because the radius of the track is so small you really feel the effort that it takes to turn at that smaller radius and so it really just we could see right away that it made sense that we we're going to have to turn both ways so unlike the flat track design that is kind of offset to allow you to kind of swoop out around the outside corners as you come around um, this track is perfectly symmetrical um, so it's very easy to lay out um, and and that way we we can turn both directions and we're not fighting against the track design um, Pausing for questions here and feel free to unmute yourself if you want to um, throw this up, but I'm curious to know what 
are the biggest challenges that you see um, for your league in the next 12, let's say 12 months? We're sort of starting to see um, things hopefully starting to open up again for people in the coming months, maybe. Um, so I'm curious what, what people's leagues, what are your biggest challenges? Um, I, I suspect that there's a few that are going to be consistent. So go ahead and type it into the chat or unmute yourself and, and jump on in. Uh, I've got some stuff if I'm not yeah, stepping on. Please do, please do. Aka and this is Hexi Mama. Uh, we're out in Austin, Texas uh, oh. at uh, New Braunfels Worst Girls Flat Track Roller Derby. And uh, I also speak for TXRD um, right here in Texas. And um, I know that you know the pandemic is affecting us all. Um, one of the big things that TXRD um, does a lot with our, because we have a really big track and we have a really big space and we depend mm -hmm. on really big venues and really big crowds, oh, which are like really hard to do during the pandemic times and everything. Oh, and so, nice. oh, <laughs> boo -boo. Um, but um, I have skated uh, a flat track roller derby. So WIFTA and short track and oh, RDCL and TXRD's wacky weird uh, particular brand of roller derby and I love them all and um, one thing I've been trying to promote in my league is uh, uh, trying out other rule sets and short track specifically um, I know a big challenge for us is going to be how do we get back from you know putting 5,000 people in a crowd together again to like you know um, make some money and everything and so one thing that we have been talking about is going to like a uh, sort of a live streamed model keeping a minimum number of humans that are necessary on staff in the building so like just your teams and staff and sort of outsourcing your crowd to a digital environment uh, and one thing i'm going to try to build some interest in is doing some uh short track exhibition events again to uh lessen the number of humans that we need in a given space and um, also get people skating again and get people skating again another thing that i have the reason one of the big reasons I also promote short track uh, as a, a bitractual or multitractual rule set thing uh, is it is a great exercise in footwork I have found um, yeah. because I know that I would try it like big like we build up a lot of speed and like I like big apex jumps like I, I would just eat myself right out of the track if I <laughs> tried the same things that I would normally depend on um, yeah, so, a little bit more control right yeah it was just yeah. like and yeah made that jump but I'm also gone off the track and out of the rink so mm. but yeah we usually have under 11 people in the worst girls active either people are injured they're rehabbing they're getting they're having babies you know it mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. okay. we got we got babies now <laughs> but it's like it's been literally what saved our team was short track because we it's New Braunfels is such a small town in Texas Mm -hmm. So it's just, we were able to keep people interested in the team and whatnot by driving all the way up to San Angelo, Texas to go skate with their flat track team and to do short track bouts. So we're trying to do those three times a year. And it's like literally short track saved our team. So I absolutely love it. And I always tell people try short track. It's amazing. That's so amazing. Thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. That's awesome. I love hearing short track saved our league because that's that's the thing. And I, I, I kind of meant to say this at the beginning, but I should have said, um, you know, that, that I'm just here, I'm like preaching the short track gospel here, but I don't actually ha gain anything from converting anyone to my, my religion of short track. So, um, I'm just pleased to, um, <laughs> like if people, if it works for people, if it helps people, then, then we're super, super stoked. Lulu and I, we just want, like I said at the beginning, roller to be to survive. So we don't have any skin in the game. I don't have anything to sell you here. I'm just, we're really here just to be helpful and, and hopefully like open some eyes and, and get some wheels turning, um, for some people. So I'm seeing, um, a few, I'm going to kind of summarize the few, um, the, the, challenges that people have been putting into the chat. Um, and uh, let me see my spot on myself again. Um, so I'm seeing recruitment and or attrition, basically low numbers as being one of the repeating um, themes in the in the comments there. Um, insurance, there's a couple of questions about insurance. Um, someone said coaching, uh, which yeah, if you've lost your kind of volunteers and your coaches and stuff that can be challenging, right? Um, space, venues, irregular venues, lost our venues, 
Um, and then I have a couple of people who um, I'm curious to hear more from who said that for some reason that I didn't quite understand um, that they haven't been able to practice in the opposite direction. And I wonder if uh, the, those of you who said that um, could maybe flesh that out a little bit for, so I understand why you haven't felt able to turn the other way. You can go ahead and unmute yourself yeah. and jump on. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that was me. So this is from Vietnam. Um, renting a venue here is basically impossible because roller derby doesn't exist here. Like we're the only team in the whole country. So everyone's like, what is this crazy sport? And they just won't rent to us. The only venue that allows us to skate there is, uh, it's a skating rink and it's the right size for short track, which is perfect. And we rented it out privately for our game, but to rent it out is, it's not affordable based on like the income of Vietnam. So it cost us uh, 3 million VND, which is about 120 US dollars for two hours, which I know when you compare it to the US, it's not that much money for what a US team would pay or a Canadian team would pay. But the average income here for a Vietnamese person is about 500 US dollars per month. So to rent out for practices two times a week or three times a week, it's just not a possibility. So it's fine for a one-off for a game, but when we're doing our regular practices, we are sharing the venue with anyone that basically comes in and it's, you've got to skate in the track direction and they're pretty lenient about letting us like hit each other and stuff. But uh, at the same time, we can't go in the opposite direction when there's little kids around skating circles. That is amazing. I, I, I feel your pain on that, but I think it's incredible. This is something which has never happened in North America that um, the regular rink like family skate has like this crew of roller derby people smashing into each other in the middle of the <laughs> rink skate. <laughs> Yeah, they gave us some weird looks when we first started, but we've kind of become a, a staple in, in the rink now. And they're all like, ah, hello. Uh, <laughs> so it's pretty fun. And some of the kids want to join in with us as well. Like when we're yeah. doing drills that are not well, hitting. This is your recruiting come program. And, this come is and join in and, Like they don't speak any English either, which is even more fun because they're like, ah, this is so cool. And then they just start doing it. So uh. it's a lot of fun, but at the same time, it does have its own challenges. Um, especially with short track with going in the opposite direction. It's just not something that we can do. Yeah. So my, um, uh, I can't wait for the documentary about you setting up the Vietnam roller derby team it comes out. I, I will, um, I will support that Kickstarter all day long. Um, and uh, I think for those who are tentative about turning right, I think everyone that's done it will agree. It's just like, oh, you just do it. And then you're just like, that was weird for a second. And then you're like, oh, right. Which direction are we going again? Like, it just becomes like your body actually knows how to do it. It's, it's like, feels weird for a minute, but I promise it's not as crazy as, uh, as you might think. So, um, so I encourage you to encourage your skaters to try it out. Um, and, and actually, you know, just as a, a bit of an aside, not to go down a rabbit hole, but we play a lot of games, um, like kind of scrimmage like games to get warmed up for practice until we're playing three on three. And, um, one of the things we do is we, we kind of go, uh, two on one, just like, I mean, we've done this in Derby, right? We'll do two on ones, three on ones, four on ones, and then we'll add in an offense. And then, we'll, you know, we've done that with five on five roller derby, but we'll go two on one. And then we, we spend a lot of time playing two on two. So two blockers from one team and a jammer and a helper from the other team. And so we'll play a few jams of that in each direction, um, just as kind of like warm up jams, getting people going before we add in a full three on three. Um, and it's a, it's a really fun, practice like it's a really fun game to play like a sub game of the game um and it's just a great way to kind of get used to the track and everything and kind of feel your skates out feel the space out feel your feel your right turns um but yeah i recommend that for a for a warm-up drill for sure lots of people are are jumping in on the comments and saying that it took it feels good on your body to turn the other way and that it took about a practice and a half to get confused about which direction was the normal one after years of having only one way to go then yeah after a while you're like which which direction are we which which one did we just do yeah so um amazing okay i'm going to talk a little bit about 
the numbers and the attrition piece, just, I feel like maybe I'm, I'm preaching a little bit to the crowd here, but um, <clears throat> uh, I want for anyone who's not sure, or for anyone who needs to convince their league, I have created not my world's best graphics here, but um, I kind of created what in my head is like, can you guys see my, my diagram here? Somebody hop, holla if you cannot. Um, this is kind of a normal year. Let's say we're kind of an average 60-ish, 55-ish uh, person league. Um, and maybe down here in the green, we have our veteran slash all-star travel team skaters. And in here in the middle, in the blue, we have kind of our home team um, year or two in or longer kind of skater. And then the orange is gonna be our, our recruitment or our fresh meet or our rookies. Okay, so start of our off season, we're kind of stable here. We've got about 15 people on our all-star team. And then the balance there um, is our, is our um, you know, home team skaters. And then we sort of start our season and we start our recruitment and maybe five of those um, home team skaters kind of jump up to the, um, the all-star team. I probably forgot to take out five who retired, um, but let's say we took them out back here at the end of the season. So, um, so we've got 2025 20, and then we bring in 25 um, rookies, let's say. And so our league is making some money. We lose a few rookies right off the bat. It's not from them. We lose a few more rookies as the season goes on. Let's say everybody else stays consistent. Good for you. You're running your league really well. Everyone's really happy. Some people get injured. Some people leave. We're down to 55 from the end of the year. And then the end of the year happens. And these 15 new people, they become your veteran home team skaters now and you lose some all-stars and you're kind of back to where you started last year and hopefully you can keep that cycle going in a positive upward direction year after year you hit covid okay we all stick around and then a bunch of people who were already on the bubble or their lives changed or they had to move home or whatever kind of leave. And then, you know, we're all kind of in a little bit of this downward trend here because we've got nothing to do and we're just hoping to keep on our people. These poor rookies that started here, they've never really been able to do anything. <laughs> so they're just hanging on for dear life, hoping something comes back for them. We got 10 people still in there from our 25. Um, Y'all can tell me if this is even close to what you're experiencing or if it's even worse than this, but this is what I would expect to see. So now we're into year three. I mean, I just picked an arbitrary start month for my year, but let's say this is us here in March of 2021. And let's say next month is post COVID. Let's, that would be nice, but let's just for the sake of argument here. So your rookies are now kind of these light orange people because they've been around for a while and they've stuck it out, but they still don't have any experience. You've got your home team skaters, you've got your all-star skaters and you recruit, you're not gonna be able to recruit 25 people because you haven't been putting on bouts and you haven't been doing stuff. So you're going to hopefully be able to get a few people who are interested in this crazy thing that you're doing. And you're gonna start running practices. And unfortunately what I've seen in the past is when you start running practices in a league that used to have this many people, 45 people come into a practice and now you've got 25 people available to come to practice, maybe 15 people show up, it sort of becomes a self-perpetuating cycle and you start losing more and more people. And those all-stars that are looking for that high competition don't have anyone left to push them forward. And you start to just go into this downward spiral over here. So what I wanna talk about is how do we rescue ourselves from this moment here so that instead of going downhill Oh, and we did an extra recruitment partway through the year here to try to, you know, bolster up our numbers. How do we make this flat or go up? Like, how do we stop this attrition from happening? Um, so for me, and I've experienced this, I've seen this in leagues before. The thing is that when you show up to practice and there's no one there and you can't scrimmage and you can't do the fun stuff, then the people who really went for it and they really got themselves out there to practice, um, they, they didn't have the greatest time at practice because they turned up and there was hardly anyone there and then we couldn't scrimmage and we couldn't do fun stuff. And so then it makes it less likely that they're gonna kind of come back to the next practice, right? They're not motivated to come back like they were the first time trying to be like, I'll go, I'll show up. I'm gonna be a good league member. I'm gonna be there for my team members. 
And then, you know, it starts to taper off from there, right? The, the cycle continues. So the way that Short Track can help with this is by making a fun practice available where people can play roller derby at practice, even if you've only got seven people that show up, even if you've only got 10 people, you can still play short track, you can compete, you can challenge yourselves, you can, um, you can really push each other um, and super fun, okay? So that's kind of the big picture. And then the second thing is that part of that graphic that I showed you was like kind of the, we had all this money when we were a 65 person league, but now we're a 42% two person league or something. So we don't have any money. So we can't rent 8,000 square foot venues anymore. We got to look for the 3,500 square foot venue. We've got to look for the basketball court in the elementary school gym. Uh, and so that is how you can um, rebuild your league's finances by focusing on smaller, cheaper venues and playing short track. Even if it's like, if you practice, let's say you have three practice days a week, um, maybe two of them are in a gym and you work on individual skills and you play short track and then you've got your one Saturday practice a week that's at the big rink and that's when you play your flat track um, practices and, and practice your um, spatial awareness and your teamwork in that environment for your future flat track games. Um, so that's kind of, you know, maybe I'm like kind of beating this to death, but I, I just want to be super clear about how I believe that the smaller game is going to actually help your leagues to rebuild faster. So hopefully you can save some money on your venues and hopefully you can have some really fun practices that people are encouraged and motivated to come back to because they got to do the roller derby wheelie shoes thing and not just a bunch of one-on-one -on -one and two-on-one -on -one drills uh, and some endurance skates, right? I mean, you should do some endurance skates sometimes, but just like not every time. So. Um, yeah, someone said they've got um, Rosen said that, um, people have to travel an hour one way to get to practice and then they don't want to get there and not actually get to play. So um, there's some questions about insurance and um, I do want to talk about that. So um, the WFTDI insurance people have said that if as long as you are meeting the same um, there is a document on the WFTDA page called WFTDA Game Safety Guidelines or something to that effect. Um, and it dictates, it's specific to a sanctioned game competitive, like where does the um, penalty box go? Where do the announcers go and all this kind of stuff, but it has some safety margins. Um, so some safety um, spacing around the outside of the um, inbounds of your track. And so if you're able to maintain that, for your short track practices and games, then you are absolutely within um, your coverage as a WFTDI or the Canadian version of that league or USARS um, has also said that it's insured under their insurance. So, um, you know, it is just roller derby and there's nothing about the game itself that is more or less uh, in particular um, risky, I would say, than, than flat track roller derby. So I hope that um, answers your question. Um, another couple of questions were in there about, um, you know, how to return to practice gradually with um, COVID restrictions. And I would say short track doesn't necessarily um, solve your problems on that front. Um, but we do have something, Sugar who's in here has done this and I can't see all the list of names, but maybe there's some other folks from our league here. Um, we bought um, hitting pads like, um, like boxing or Taekwondo hitting pads from Everlast. They're just these big square foamy things and we hang them from hooks on the wall and we practice slamming into them, um, which is great. And if we are allowed to get a little bit closer together, but still not do contact, then one skater can hold the hitting pad for the other. So it's like you get to hit a move, you know, you can hit a moving target or you can be stationary and practice your hitting. So um, that's pretty fun. Um, and we are practicing roller derby um, twice a week at Roller Skate Club in our, we can have 10 people in the room. People have their boxes and we have some lanes. So everyone has to be two and a half meters apart from one another and wearing masks in our venue. And, um, and we practice all kinds of individual skills and we, we can't do fitness. We can't do high intensity um, indoor group fitness in British Columbia right now, but we can do low intensity. So we just work on body mechanics and footwork and edges and control 
and um, a bit of strength stuff in there. So, um, so I definitely think that if you're ready to, if your area is ready to have people back for um, any kind of indoor group fitness or outdoor, I know someone mentioned in Scotland, you can't be indoors with anyone, but if you're allowed to be in groups outside, potentially, we just got that privilege um, a couple weeks ago here. Um, then, then I recommend, you know, I'm happy to share some like ideas with you on the side about practice plans about how you can do spaced out solo skills practices that are still really valuable for your roller derby, especially as people are coming back from a long time, potentially not being on skates much or certainly not doing the roller derby thing on skates much. It's going to be really important for people to take a measured and, um, uh, planful approach to return to roller derby and return to contact. So um, that'll definitely be pretty important. Um, let's talk about the rules. I know there's a few people who haven't, um, who were asking about the rules and I do have like a little cheat sheet. Um, so let me see if I can share that for a second here. Um, okay, so the spirit of play, this is part of the thing that makes it easier to officiate this game is that rather than having the officials um, operate like um, like a referee, like a, like a policeman who, or a police person who is, um, you know, calling out all of the faults and fouls and errors, and the rest of us are doing our best to get away with as much as we can. In short track, we are taking it upon ourselves as skaters to um, play fair and have fun and to, um, to, make sure that if we foul someone um, accidentally, that we then remedy that foul by yielding advantage to the other skater. So um, the, the, read the last sentence here, the integrity, fun and fair and safe play of short track roller derby depends on each skater's responsibility to uphold the spirit of the game. And this responsibility should not be taken lightly. So we took this um, kind of idea from, we borrowed this from, um, uh, ultimate frisbee and in ultimate frisbee there is no official and the players self-officiate and if they feel that someone on the other team has committed a foul or an illegal capture an illegal throw then kind of the game stops and they figure it out and they return the um, disc to the right spot and then they play on so we're not exactly stopping the game in the middle to have a debate but the idea is if i foul someone then I step aside and I let them get in front of me. Or if I commit a foul by falling back to the back of the pack out of play, then I just remedy that foul by just catching my ass up and getting back into the pack. Um, so the, the spirit of play is something that um, is different. It's a different feeling. It's a different notion. It's a different whole philosophy than kind of many traditional competitive sports where um, a lot of dirty tricks go on on the side and, or, or accidentally like, oops, I cut, I totally cut the track, but the ref didn't see me. So I kept going. That's not the, the, the spirit of play at short track roller derby. It's the spirit of play is like, oops, I cut the track here. Let me remedy that go by. Okay. Now I'm going to return to play safely. Um, any questions on that? Go ahead and unmute yourself. If you, um, if you want to jump in on that, um, and then we'll go over the basics of the game. So it's two teams of seven skaters. Um, you play two periods, 10 jams each. So um, there's every jam is the same length of time. Okay, so it's a minute jam. There's no lead jammer. Um, no one can call it off. It's just by the clock. And you start scoring on the first scoring pass. And there's 30 seconds between jams for the teams to put out new lineups. Um, so it means that the timing and the officiating is just a little bit simpler because we're not calling a lead jammer, we're not changing the length of jams, um, every jam is going to be the same length of time. Um, we've already talked about this, but the first period is skated clockwise and the second period is counterclockwise. Um, this uh, piece here, we have a jammer order. So basically everyone jams in order. So we have an armband system instead of a jersey number system. So kind of like a batting order in baseball, you might not always be in the same number in the game. So in jam one, um, player number one is gonna be the jammer. In jam two, player number two is gonna be the jammer and so on up to jam number seven. And then after jam seven, so jams eight, nine and 10 for that period, um, any skater can jam. So this is just a strategic coaching decision. Maybe your very best jammer goes out 
in jam two, jam eight, and jam 10, for example, uh, or one, eight, eight, and 10, or wh whatever you like. But, um, but you, you put everyone out in order from one to seven, and then you get to play around. So no jam, no lead jammer, um, and you'd only call off a jam if there was an injury. Um, each pass through the pack by the jammer, um, including your own team's jammers or your own team's lockers, counts for one point. So again, this is making the officiating so much easier because the officials don't have to track hips of five different skaters that you may or may not have passed or then repassed and so on and so forth. It's like if you get out the front of the pack, basically, if you've done it without committing a foul, then you've scored one point. Okay, so typical games that we have played here in Vancouver with our groups have been final scores in the kind of high 30s, mid 40s um, for, for the full two periods. Um, fouls I talked about may be remedied by yielding. So um, there's different ways to yield different types of fouls. So we're not going to go into all the details, but basically if you low block someone or you cut the track, then you would stand aside at, for two seconds at least and allow the skaters that you fouled to pass you by or regain position. And then you, you come back to, um, to game play. And if you fail to yield and the, the official has um, called you to yield, um, then your, or if it's an egregious foul, then it's minus two points for your team. So we haven't seen a lot of minus two points, but also that's potentially partly been because um, we haven't at Roller Skate Club had the opportunity or resources to do a really great job with a lot of official training, um, which is definitely something that we want to work on going forward. Um, so then there's a little bit of details about how to remedy different fouls and we play with two referees on skates and one timekeeper and one scorekeeper. So those are kind of like the big basics. Um, so let's see, I'm gonna see if there's, oh, 59 to 49 was Saigon's final score for their game, amazing. Um, I think that one of the pieces that will be important um, that we haven't truly had to deal with yet at Roller Skate Club is um, because we started playing it with veteran skaters who had experienced flat track roller derby and had experienced penalties and officials calling the, calling the penalties is that as we're bringing new skaters through that we will need to spend time at practice blowing a lot of whistles and being very, very clear about penalties committed so that our new skaters can learn what the penalties are so that they can learn how to self-regulate and how to know that they need to yield for a foul. Um, so something in our space, for example, um, uh, a lot of our newer short track skaters are um, really unaware of the track boundaries in a way that um, veteran flat track roller derby players are very, very, very respectful of the track boundaries at all times. And so that's something that we're always trying to like, no, 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 it's lava. You can't go there. You can't go there. You know, trying to teach that. So that is definitely um, an educational piece to make the game work with new skaters before they can play a, a game in, in competition. They have to be aware of when they're committing a penalty, when they're committing a foul. Um, yeah, Sugar says she finds it similar to practice where you have no refs and you just like correct your teammates or, or helpfully point out like, oh, I think that was a cut or that seemed like an elbow to me or whatever. And then they, they correct. So um, yeah. So listen, I've yacked a lot. Um, I would love to open it up for kind of general conversation. If there's people have questions, like feel free, let's unmute yourself, um, raise your hand if you want to, or, or, or jump in there. And I'd love to see, um, hear from you kind of what you need or what more questions have come up. Um, yeah, jump on in. Who has um, trained up a group of uh, like rookie skaters um, as part of your pre-COVID? Julia? Okay, hi. Well, actually I do adult and children, so I can't wait to bring this to the kids and nice. see how they feel about it. Yeah. yeah. I'm really excited about that. But yeah, we have, um, coming back from COVID, we have like 10 new children skaters and we still have a ton of new derby players. So it's gonna be great to 
bring this and say, hey, are you interested? You know, it's good. I can't wait. <laughs> I'm pretty excited. Yay. Awesome. That's awesome. Um, uh, Stacy, I know you're working with GVRD. You've got um, men and women and like a very competitive group of people. What questions are coming up for you? Well, I don't have many questions yet. As of right now, we're just kind of, um, we're getting our training committee going and trying to look at what reintroduction looks like for everyone. And so we have all different levels. We have, um, you know, competitive Vancouver murder. We have the whip team, Anarchy Angels. And it's really hard trying to think about how to keep these people interested and competitive as well as really, um, work on all our new interests because we're going to have we have our bunnies team as well which is um the one step up after you graduate but the whole graduating system is going to be different so um yeah. we're looking to reschedule uh restructure our beginners uh training as well as like i just thought that short track would be such a great um <laughs> such a great thing to put in so that those rookies get more time, more experience on the track with different levels and it doesn't have to be contact necessarily. And to gain those skills and that self-awareness, because when I did short track, one of the great things I learned was how aware I was of my own body. And I think everyone could <laughs> benefit from that. So hopefully using this as a tool for them, but as well as hopefully grand, I'd love for all of us Vancouver folk who would like to continue playing roller derby have a local league that we could all be part of like we like the angels could have a few different teams playing at a certain level so could the bunnies and as well as like um and incorporating all genders we can incorporate the you know the murder as well um and the nwo and people from vancouver island and rolla like we'd love to yeah. have just that interactive play that we probably won't get because of the lack of travel because of COVID. So yeah, absolutely. I'm kind of hoping <laughs> that grows for all of us. That's a great point about um, sort of having to keep our travel pretty uh, regional at best for a while too. Um, you know, those of you that are in the States, maybe you don't have as many rules as we have in Canada, but we're not allowed to go anywhere. They canceled all the flights to everywhere sunny. It's so sad. So we haven't left our towns. Um, but yeah, so, so Rolla has been working on like right before COVID, we had just drafted our two roller derby teams from our, our people that had been with us through like two rounds of boot camps and learning and and it was so fucking awesome and we were working we were hollering up the hill to squamish and nanaimo and um nwo and she already trying to get um games going because we're like okay we made a team now we got to find places for people to play right and so we also had our um we had been planning for september 2020 to host a um, short track jamboree. This is something semi ridiculous that um, Lulu and I had in our vision when we created short track was that the tournaments were going to be called jamborees. And they were going to be like um, rugby sevens tournaments where everyone comes in costumes in the stands and it's all ridiculous and people are like hooting and hollering and weird teeny kind of like a roller con kind of uh, challenge bout atmosphere where people have weird costumes and weird team names and you know kind of like mashup teams all the time and that kind of thing so I think it's a super great point about um about uh like just a way that we can play local games that if you know you can take if you've got 15 people well you can put two teams together and go play another house team and their two teams and have just like a fun, you know, little round robin -y day or whatever. And just like, you know, play the roller derby and see other people that aren't your own teammates for the first time in years and all that kind of thing. Right. So yeah, lots of, lots of pluses on the costumes. Nice. Um, some people are asking for some video of games that and stuff that has been played. So if you go to, I will, I will put it, um, in the chat or maybe someone can do in the chat for me um, and we'll when we post this recording we'll put it in the recording notes um, but we um, we have some footage that we took some like highlight sizzle reel from when we introduced 
short track at RollerCon 2018. And there's some um, interviews from the skaters that we taught to play and from the fans and announcers and stuff like that. So um, it's a bit sizzle reel. It's not like full um, bout stuff. Um, but I know that there's a couple of teams that have um, got some video up on their Facebook pages. And um, when I get a minute to breathe, I'm definitely um, hoping to go um, reach out to them and um, ask if they can send us the videos and we can put them up on YouTube, for example, so that people can just, you know, find them a little bit more easily. Um, and uh, what else? Let's see. Claire, they've got some, oh, you have some Saigon Roller Derby Facebook page game. Oh, amazing. Amazing. I can't wait to check that out. Um, one of the first teams that we encountered that we had never even known or talked to or anything was um, the, oh, now I'm going to get this wrong. I can't remember now if it was Dubai or if it was Abu Dhabi, but like out of nowhere after that 2018 roller con, like we started to hear of people from uh, Poland and Russia and then like the first short track game, UAE, thanks Claire. Um, so UAE generally, okay. Um, and they put on a, a, like a derby demo for some sort of fitness strength training kind of like convention thing that was happening um and they had a really small space to do it in so they did an even smaller track and it was super rookies um but they put on a short track bout for their fans which is incredible so it was really really neat to see people just like picking up on it from different places in the world particularly the places like the um the u.s army bases in asia where it's like a rotating cast of characters and so there's not a lot of ability to like build up a big league of 40 people and so they're like okay great you know we're in south korea or we're in okinawa japan and we can throw you know we we've got 12 people we're making this happen kind of a thing right so um yeah really cool to see where it has gone around the world um for resources oh good this is a great question after playing short track is it difficult to switch back to playing wftda roller derby rules like remembering that there's a penalty box to go to and things like that <laughs> anyone can speak to that yeah I was, I was saying that like what i notice is that when i go to short track i like go to catch the jammer and i'm like off the track but then when I go to flat track, I go to catch the jammer and then they like go past me just like the first few jams. You're like, oh yeah, this is bigger. And you just have to like reorient your mind to that. But then once you get that down, the rest like makes sense. Cause if any of the like grabbing or penalty or whatever, like you might have a moment where you're like, oh, you like, but you, you get that really quick, but it's the, like, you do that shot across the track to catch them on the other side. And then you're like out or dance. not all the way there. <laughs> Um, there was another question that I saw in the chat that I forgot to answer, which was about contact levels. And so we do have, we've adapted the junior roller derby um, low contact rules um, from JRDA and we've adapted them to short track. Um, and we play that primarily with our players, especially even our refs, like all the people in our crew that have been on, you know, Terminal City All-Stars and Team Canada and all that stuff that we are lucky enough to get to play with sometimes we play low contact and it's still very competitive and very fun, but all us old folks don't feel like we got run over by a truck after the game, which is really fun. Um, so yeah, we, I love low contact short track rules. And so it's basically, we took the contact rule of, short, of JRDA, which is that you can't make, um, I believe the wording is, and we have it, it's in our rule set, it's Appendix D, it's at the end, it describes it, but if I'm remembering correctly, it's that you can't accelerate into contact, but you can make contact and then push. I'm getting, that's not the wording, but that's kind of the gist of it. And so we use pushing that hitting, but we found that that made it, um, uh, without adjusting any of the other rules, it gave the blockers all of the advantage and all of the power and it made it almost impossible for the jammer to get through a pair of good blockers. So we took away some of the blockers power as well. So we took away um, bracing and we took away um, blocking face to face. So in the short track, low contact rules, you can turn around on the track and put yourself into position, but you can't meet a skater with your chest or at their chest. Um, I mean, it's really on the, if a jammer is coming through and a blocker turns around, it's really on the blocker, not on the jammer in that case. But um, 
Uh, but yeah, and you can't like race your blocker because it's just too much with the, if the jammer doesn't have the ability to like hit away and break up that, the, that pair, it's just too much advantage for the blockers. So that's the little adjustments that we made after practicing with it um, a few times and testing it out. So um, big fan of uh, low contact short track. And I have to say, I am one of those people that was a competitive, um, never quite as good as I wanted to be, but diehard competitive roller derby skater, um, you know, always trying for or being on the all-star team and really trying to compete. And I, the idea of recreational or low contact roller derby was all, never even remotely interesting to me because it felt like baby kitten nap time. Like it's just going to be low skill, boring, easy, like, you know, kind of just like, it's just not for me, but I have been very pleasantly surprised by short track um, and by the low contact rules that I find it immensely challenging. Um, you know, obviously like you still need to be playing with people who are at a similar skill level to you to be really challenged. But, um, you know, whether I'm playing with people way better than me, like Bruceberry Pie and, um, you know, Smokey and, and Lulu Demon, or I'm playing with people that I've taught, <clears throat> excuse me, to play roller derby in the last year or two, um, and they've got a ways to go. Like, it's still really, really fun. And especially if you have a mixed level team and, you know, it's, it's really, it, it still feels competitive. It still has, it has a lot to offer for me personally as someone who never thought that they would be interested in something like that. So, so I give you that. Um, we've kind of gone through our hour here. So I wanna be um, conscious of people's time. Are there any kind of last minute um, questions? I wanna guide people to um, the, uh, the uh, short track roller derby resources page. Um, so if you go to rollerskateclub.com forward slash, and then it's short dash track dash roller dash derby dash resources. Um, or if you just Google search short track roller derby, you will find our page and there's some resources on there. You can download the rules. Um, you can obviously download the, the track design. Um, you can get on our interest list. So we have kind of a leagues list. Um, and, but also if you just want to get on our email program, you can fill out the like, I'm interested form and um, and we'll just make sure that you get added to um, you know our email list for any kind of updates and news and stuff that are going on. And um, I've got some people commenting about some of the different um, mechanisms that you, they used for the low contact and they didn't give the jammers that advantage. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so there's lots of resources there and there's our short track roller derby info group on Facebook um, and there's people, I don't know if there's anyone on this call today, but there's a zillion people in Argentina and South America who are super duper stoked on short track. They're having a whole league. They've created a whole universe of short track teams down there. They're like hot to trot. So um, I believe that this session is ultimately gonna get um, Spanish subtitles on it. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Ooh, tips for how to train refs for this. Do you recommend that players alternate between refereeing and playing? I think that that is great. I think that um, I wouldn't necessarily put a beginner skater um, in an important refer refereeing role <laughs> if they don't know what to look for for the penalties and stuff. But I do think it's good practice for people to skate around and keep their eye on the track and monitor their time and kind of understand. Um, Official training is something I would say we're not strong on because none of us who are kind of like leading this charge are officials or have been trained as officials. For example, we still have never gotten around to taking photographs of the hand signals for the officials that are in the rules. It's still all just written out. <laughs> Just like, we need to get it done. Um, but if anyone here is an official um, or, you know, has some experience with official training, officiating, um, that's definitely something that we're, we're looking for support on. So if there's someone who could um, help us figure out the best way to provide official training, um, we would love that. So I, what we find is that our officials tend to be um, really quiet. So they're kind of letting the game play, which is kind of the idea. And the skaters are um, trying to do their best to yield their own fouls and stuff. But as the um, a more experienced player, I'm seeing fouls that aren't getting called and aren't getting addressed. And so that's something that we're trying to work on with our officials when we get back into the into the game is actually making them practice calling all the fouls out loud, for example, like just getting in the practice of see it, say it, see it, say it kind of a thing and, and finding their voice a bit more. Um, but yeah. Um, 
this has been amazing. It's really been great to see all of your faces. Um, I'm gonna like, there's two pages full of people here. Lots of people have their, um, their videos off, um, but it's been great to see those few faces that are turned on. Um, I think we'll, we'll call it there. Um, unless there's any last questions. And then if anyone wants to stay on um, and ask any questions about Roller Skate Club, our instructor training program um, that a couple people in the call just are about to complete, um, or um, yeah, anything about Roller Skate Club, um, I will be here. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks for joining us. Adios. Because I, I'm just going to throw in, I asked the um, no contact question, thinking about our kids playing, because uh -huh. I've been I've been involved very much in getting the kids started in those with those level one kids, and I, I saw somebody's comment there, but you know, Derby needs contact. <laughs> We've noticed how much harder it can be to get those level one kids to get through the pack and such. Like, but if those kids are good at no contact. Holy cow, do they make amazing derby players later. <laughs> but it's just that if, if it, it's that curiosity of how well that no contact, does it still work on that track with just two people? Yeah, I haven't tried it myself. Um, and um, uh, I think it would be easier to, let's say, convince children to do it than it would be for adults, especially people who have played the other way. <laughs> they get to start no contact and they get to build up to it that that's an easy sell yeah, yeah exactly that's what I was gonna say so for people who aren't ready for that like they're like oh I really like roller derby but I'm not ready for that physicality like I started training with the local league thinking I was never going to play roller derby. I just wanted to get better at skating. And um, in fresh meat kind of, we did all this non-contact stuff and I was like, oh, I really wow. like it. And then it got me comfortable to feeling like I could do the contact um, while I was learning like the gameplay, no contact, right? And then there are still some people who are like still not, don't ever want to do that. And so having those different levels and different games allows for that, that different, um, skills and comfort levels for people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really yeah. been a conversation we've had in alberta here too of could we have a rat you know sort of a, a level two derby league and i think the short track that brings that doable that makes it incredibly doable so yeah for sure it's a great rec league i know that um pfm potential fresh meat as they used to be known in seattle area that they've been playing some short track um, with their people too. And, and we, we, Lulu and I went down there to um, attend one of their practices and um, we taught people the basic rules of short track in about, you know, 45 minutes or something. And then we, we went and scrimmaged and there were skaters who had never skated in a jam before who were like, okay, let's play short track. <laughs> and um, it was really cool to see, um, you know, it's like so interesting to see when you put something other than thinking about your roller skates and your wheels in front of somebody who's a newer skater, how suddenly the skating starts to happen and now they have other things to focus on, like not getting mushed by another skater. And um, it's a really fun, um, it's, it's just really fun to see like the, the acceleration that people make, right? Yeah. Um, Claire says, come to Vietnam. She's gonna host a clinic. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, Elizabeth was asking if anyone's able to put on a clinic for short track. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's gonna have to be pending all the um, travel and everything, but Roller Skate Club, we're, we're hoping to revive our skate festival that we were meant to host last April um, and revive it into like a really big um, roller skating festival um, with some roller derby and kind of all kinds of stuff. So um, hopefully um, we will all see you there next year so someone roller skates i don't know about you guys but if you fail right or those creepy people at the park they're like hey roller skates you should come come talk to me yes i love that i didn't talk about that i don't think so i just hit the recording back on just to kind of capture that conversation which is that all these leagues that have um a, a, that you know that diagram i showed like this recruitment dip this numbers dip and you have to build back up it's like absolutely don't be afraid to to put on roller skating like roller discos or 
you know, just like reach out to all those skaters because what we, what we always find is that there's the skaters that come to us because they're like, I want to do roller dance, or I just want to learn how to not fall on my face when I'm skating outside or whatever. And then they see what we're offering and they're like, Oh, and they're like, I didn't thought of that before, but maybe, and then like, they kind of get there. So, you know, I think that a big opportunity for leagues who are trying to rebuild their, their membership is to really think big. Like you've talked about there in Lethbridge about, um, about embracing all the all the roller skaters whether they're dance or whether they they you know they don't know what they don't know yet but you'll show them and you'll show them that they can be part of your community um and maybe those are your future volunteers or maybe they're your future refs or maybe they're your future um new recruits so definitely awesome to be um reaching out and i love that you've like created your online training program for that that's super super cool yeah it's something yeah yeah <laughs> i mentioned that before too i said it wasn't i wasn't going to be sales pitchy but roller skate club did create um an online membership and we have a six week roller skating 101 online course as well and so that's definitely something we're happy to provide some league discounts because we're interested in supporting derby so if people are wanting to um, start recruiting people now and have them go through a roller skating 101 six week learn to roller skate program um or join our membership and work on different skills. Um, you know, all, most of the stuff can be done in the living room. The one-on-one -on -one program, you kind of have to go out to a parking lot or a parking garage or somewhere where you can, you know, take some strides a little bit um, for some parts of it. But um, that's a, something that we're really eager to help support people. So if you can get your people who are already on your list or who are reaching out like, hey, when are you guys going to start doing recruitment again, you can get them on their roller skates and you can get them practicing and learning their fundamental skills until you're able to meet up as a group. Um, I think that's a really, really smart way to, um, to sort of hit the ground running as it were. Yeah. Uh, going to a high school gym for short track may also help recruit older teens. So, oh, Lacey, that's so cool that your league allows anyone 16 plus. I know that a lot of places have insurance challenges to um, mix uh, uh, minors and adults in roller derby. So that's really, really cool that you're able to do that. I love it. I love it. All right. Uh, Texas, any questions? I'm just calling you Texas because I see only one name on that. <laughs> You know, you're married. Yeah, Texas. Texas. Lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, and actually, I'm really interested in um, promoting short track in my league. So, I, I captained the um, right right up until COVID hit. I was captaining our travel team. It was really exciting. We were about to host our first travel team tournament again since Skate by Skate West of a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I missed it. Um, but one of the things I was actually really interested in short track for in the context of our bank league was not just reducing the number, I mean, reducing our number of staff, right, that we can have kind of on site um, to, you know, digitally outsource our audience um, is, is definitely an advantage and something I'm trying to get my folks to explore. Um, but also I call it field trips to flat track, right? Encouraging them to get out and play some other rule sets because they they do stuff that we don't learn and that we don't know. And there are things that you don't have to do footwork wise mm. on the bank because you have the angle that you have to depend more on and right. you know, a lot of different things. Um, Is that why you try to have your team come skate with my team constantly? Yeah, that's part Thanks, of it. Yeah. Life. <laughs> I, I just kind of get them out of the house, you know? Um, but I know here in, here in Travis County, we're a little stuck for the moment. We're just getting back to stage three in Travis County. Um, our, our governor in Texas lifted most of the COVID restrictions, which is not we a We don't have idea. feelings about it, right? No. Oh, no hard um, feelings. But I know, so down here, we're just barely getting to the point where we are um, uh, just getting back to like uh, inside of the league warehouse rentals where we can have small groups renting out our track um, within the league. Um, but we do have a sizable paved parking lot space, which is, you know, unused 90% of the time because it's just our warehouse sitting there. Um, what well, I'm going to see if we can get a flat track, um, well, a short flat track laid out on that um for us uh, and i was actually curious because I, I i thought it was interesting about the um you know you know the no bracing bit and i know that that is a really excellent point as far as like um you know if you're if your jammers are getting stuck all the time uh, and especially um using it as sort of a pipeline for um bringing in newer skaters to play like not derby light but like a lighter version of roller derby right there's like less stuff going on there's sort of blockers uh, making sure that they can still get through and get that full 
you know, experience both different working pieces of roller derby mm -hmm. at a more accessible level. Um, but one of the things I'm also really interested in is taking our old ass vets and our old, uh, you know, stuck in our ways, bank trackers, oh, I've been doing this 10 years, I don't need no flat track folks to try out something a little bit different and try and work on those different skills. So I'm really interested in actually, um, uh, you know, taking our, like our context of our like little, um, our, our meta of skills and um, things that we typically do and putting those in the context of that. So I'm curious if you, if y'all have tried or what it looks like with different skill levels of folks, um, you know, when you include bracing, when you include two walling, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that if y'all have ever seen it look different, like um, if we we're using your, you know, your sort of your freshies and, and level twos uh, versus if it's, say, like a big, a big bunch of level threes, whatever contact level it is. Um, does that do you still see people still people see still see people getting stuck the same way as far as your jammers getting stuck on good two walls or I was just curious what that looks like? Yeah, I think if you have um, a pair of really skilled blockers who and, and you're playing full contact rules, um, mm -hmm. and you have a, a less skilled or newer jammer then I mean, it's almost the same in any context. The jammer's gonna have a hard time getting through. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't, but I think that it's a, definitely a worthwhile exercise and definitely a, a good learning and training for both skill levels to play mixed skill at the low contact level. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, and I mean, I've even, it really depends who's playing, but I've even seen people playing the low contact level who are like, whoa, this is more intense than I was expecting, you know, like this is really still high contact, like it's really still pretty aggressive. Um, so you kind of have to, um, I don't like kind of personally like metered games where it's like, okay, everyone go like your 50% or whatever. Um, Cause I find I mean, obviously one person's 50 is someone, somebody else is 112. So um, yeah. But yeah, I think if you've got newer skaters and you're playing the full contact version where your blockers are bracing, where they're um, uh, blocking backwards, where they're hitting, I think that would be, um, you know, potentially off-putting to a, a junior skater. Unless that skater is like, no, 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 I really want to learn. I really want to get my ass kicked. So I'm, I can, you know. We have asses by the junior skaters in San Angelo. We're like, oh shit, I want to grow up to be like those kids. Yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, that good joints. God, I miss not having arthritis. <laughs> I, uh, I was just going to say what Claire said about um, higher level blockers. So one thing I miss playing short track is the pivot. Because um, like when you're jamming, you're having a hard time. You're like, come on, you know? And so like one thing it, that you get from the blockers who have um, played short track is they'll be like, oh, I got to go help, right? You know, like that's already set in there with them. So then that's when that can help out. So as long as you like your teams are balanced in terms of you don't have like all really great, you know, flat track coming from flat track skaters on one team and all is like super rookie, you'll be okay. Um, you know, and you balance your lines a bit, then you can have that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to shout out to Claire who said that they're fundraising. Um, this is a great idea for a bout with low attendance. They had a live stream with a PayPal link and their announcer would promote donating the equivalent of an entrance ticket on the live feed. That's really, really cool. I love the ideas of like, um, yeah, bringing back our, our big A fundraiser, B recruitment tool of a, a big splashy uh, live bout event and then how to do that with um, short numbers of including your fans, obviously, right? So um, that, those are some really super clever ideas. And Claire, they've got people who've been skating for four months, skating with people who have been doing it for 10 years. So that is pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Um, I think we'll leave it there, everyone. Thanks so much for your contributions. I know there's still like um, not a lot of videos, but there's still like 14 people on the call. So thanks for everyone who's like stuck it out. And um, I'm not going to say my email out loud on the recording on the YouTube, but um, I feel like you will know how to find me and um, we'll get this uh, link sent out to all the people who are here live and um, we'll get this up on YouTube so that other people can enjoy it afterwards as well. So please feel free to reach out to us at Roller Skate Club anytime um, for any questions. And like I said, we're just here to support roller derby and all of you and make sure that we can all be successful and um, return to the glory that once was. So thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Enjoyed it.